I'm Michael Bolton. I live in Toronto, Canada. I'm a tester and I help people to learn about testing. The subject of this conference is digital transformation and I'd like to tell you a couple of stories that have made me feel victims of digital transformation. Uh, things as well that I think are getting lost when we consider how technology affects our lives and how we interact with it. In order to help me with that, I'm going to introduce you to some of my friends and colleagues too. Here's something that happened to me two minutes after claiming my bags at Copenhagen Airport. Ironically, I was on my way to the Eurostar software testing conference. Here I'm going to uh, go to English and go down here, departures. I want to have a look at that. There you go, right there, bad gateway. There you go. Here's an airport here in Toronto is Canada's busiest. Like other major airports around the world, hundreds of flights are leaving and arriving daily. On the 7th of May, 2022, I came back to Toronto after an extended trip in Europe. Part of the process of re-entering the country involves using the ArriveCan app, which is developed for processing of travelers' information and, among other things, checking their COVID status. When I walked through customs, I filled out the form at the customs machine, walked to the customs agent, and the customs agent uh, looked at my ArriveCan status, took a QR code, and put a green sticker on my passport. The green sticker looked something like this. That indicated to me and to the other people at the airport that I could be passed through without being subjected to quarantine or a random COVID-19 test. A few days later, I received a phone call from a robot. The robot told me that my COVID test hadn't been submitted, hadn't been performed, that I was subject to a $750,000 fine, and it provided me with a phone number that I could call. When I called the phone number asking what I should do next, nobody knew the answer. They suggested that I go to the website. The website suggested that I call the phone number. The next person at the phone number suggested that I look at the website again. I went back and forth not knowing how to interpret the message that I had received and not understanding what to do next. This put me into a bit of a panic because I had to travel to Switzerland on the following Saturday. I knew that my COVID status was as safe as it could be. I'd received three full vaccinations and had just received a fourth one, and I had caught COVID in March. And so it was very unlikely, it seemed to me, that I should be selected for a random COVID test at that point. Nonetheless, nobody was able to tell me what to do. So I got a test, I submitted it as quickly as possible, and waited. Turns out there was a bug in all this. Of the people who use the ArriveCan app and who pass through customs, about 3% received these notifications that they should report for COVID tests or quarantine in error. After that story came out, other stories started coming out too. According to the Customs Agents Union, about a third of the people trying to cross the border had problems with the ArriveCan app. Some hadn't been aware the app was mandatory or didn't have mobile phones that supported it. Others found the app too confusing, too unfriendly to the user, and so the customs officers had to provide tech support, which dramatically slowed things down. And medical people were saying that the app wasn't useful since the meaning of fully vaccinated wasn't up to date even without the app. Tai Xiaomei, my friend and colleague in China, reports similar experiences with software there. Uh, after three months of locking at home, and uh, yeah, we, we are uh, we can go out, and uh, um, many people they uh, have a lot of things to do. Uh, to some things related with some uh, government government office, and I uh, 
uh, I go to the police station and police office at one day and there is a long queue because many people go to there that long queue and uh, uh, for uh, for every of us if you want to enter the office you must scan a QR code to uh, prove that you are a healthy person yeah <laughs> so and uh, one woman I found he was uh, uh, he was very angry and argue with the, the people there because uh, he uh, she doesn't know what reason uh, uh, she just cannot scan the QR code and it doesn't work and even she uh, reinstalled the app and she doesn't work for her phone and she called uh, a lot of different um, person try to solve her problem but no one can answer her and I from a software perspective I know that is a bug because every other person for, uh, for other people that works but uh, just for her I don't know what caused her that bug but uh, uh, okay she has a problem and she cannot he, she just cannot enter that office to do some business and not just for this place actually if she cannot solve this problem she cannot do anything in any other place because whenever we want to enter any other public area you have to scan the code and the the the, the qr code shows green and that that, that means you are you're safe yeah but uh, for for her, she 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 has a big trouble. <laughs> and for another case, uh, for some people, for in some day, and some people just uh, found uh, their code, their QR code, um, becomes red, not green anymore, becomes red, and for unknown reason. Nobody knows who, for what kind of reason she didn't go anywhere. She just to stay at home. But uh, another day, the, the code becomes right, and she. Uh, so many other. So she, her neighbors will think she, she was a dangerous person. <laughs> so, so these kind of things, uh, a social uh, concerns has some social concerns. Uh, has a lot of impact a big impact to to the user uh, and uh, uh, for for unknown reason it all started with one little mistake one error that it was completely easy for a civilian a, a non-expert somebody who's not in the business to make you see what happened was in sweden I lost my glasses. They fell out of my pocket, ironically, on a bike ride. My wife knew how to solve this problem. She was aware that I had a pair of spare glasses that she could send to me, and it would be very helpful for it to arrive overnight. So we went to FedEx, the company that in its advertising many years ago promised when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. My wife, in good faith, filled out the valuation for the glasses. That is the replacement value. What she did not understand, and what anybody who's not in the shipping business wouldn't understand, is that the customs valuation and the value of the glasses for purchase and the value of the glasses for somebody who is using them, other than their user, are all different. The customs valuation of the glasses is essentially zero. They're not going to be resold. They're for my own personal purposes. The cost to replace the glasses is about $1,000 Canadian, maybe a little less than that. However, putting the $1,000 figure into the customs valuation triggered the software to report the wrong thing to the customs officers. I lost my glasses on a Monday. My wife sent the glasses on Tuesday. 
On Wednesday, in Sweden, I received this message. Well, I can survive for three days without my glasses, but this is wonderful. The glasses are scheduled for delivery tomorrow. Then I got this message. Hi, it says. International clearance of your package has been delayed. Now, I looked on the page to see if there was anything that could help me understand what I needed to do. Oh, clearance instructions from the importer, I guess that's me, are required. The recommended action is the importer must provide instructions. Then, no scheduled delivery date is available at this time. What do we see on this page that might suggest where I should look? Well, let's see. Oh, I can get status updates for one thing. Sc scroll down. Oh, but this isn't actually a status update. This is a form whereby I can submit an email address so that I can receive status updates when they're available. Let's see if there's anything else that might help me to find out what I should do, where I should go in order to provide those instructions. I looked around the FedEx site. I clicked for uh, delivery options, nothing available there. Scrolled up and down on the page. I searched in vain for some place that could help me understand what I needed to do to solve this problem. Oh, there's a button down here. I can click on that. It says Ask FedEx, except clicking on the button doesn't do a thing. So notice that except for the dead Ask FedEx button, it's not obvious that the software is failing to do something that its vendors or its builders intended it to do correctly. Let's think about that. There's a requirement to notify the user that additional instructions are required. There's a requirement to provide a means by which the user might receive status updates when there are status updates available. But maybe there is a requirement to link the user to somewhere where they can provide the information they need to provide, and maybe there's not such a requirement. The trouble is that the builders who are building this product are probably not experiencing the problems that the product is intended to solve. That's an important thing for testers to be able to do, to be able to identify the context in which the software is going to be used, the problems that the user is trying to solve, and whether the problem is being solved. As one of the principles of the context-driven software testing movement states, the product is a solution to a problem. And if the problem isn't solved, then the software doesn't work. So what happened next in the great FedEx delivery saga? FedEx was sent three emails. One came from Mary and two came from me on Friday. I called FedEx three times on Friday trying to find someone who could tell me what I needed to do in order to submit the additional instructions, whatever they were supposed to be. There were two more emails that came from me the following Monday. Of course, the offices to handle this kind of problem were closed on Saturday and Sunday. There were three more phone calls from me on Monday. One of them was a call in which I was promised that a supervisor would call me back within the half hour. I know the supervisor didn't call me back within the half hour. My phone log would have told me so. So that promised call back on Monday never happened. One of the people that I did manage to speak to, not a supervisor on Monday, provided to me, perhaps by accident, a contact name, but no info for the person who was supposed to be handling my case. That prompted another email from me to FedEx on Tuesday, and at last, I got an email from a person at FedEx. Uh, I don't want to reveal her name to anybody in particular, so I'll call her Jay. Jay wants to see proof that I've entered Sweden. I'm sending this message from Sweden. I'm in Sweden. I wouldn't be complaining about not being able to get my glasses if I were not in Sweden. But Jay wants to see proof, or perhaps FedEx, or perhaps the customs clearance people want to see proof that I've entered Sweden. Jay also provided an explanation for the problems that I was seeing. Here's what she says. 
Hello, Michael. Apologies for the delay in getting back to you. Sweden is experiencing delay issues due to TNT and FedEx systems integration. TNT is another delivery service that FedEx merged with. Later on, I found out from a tester at the Eurostar conference that this project has been going on since 2014. This is a kind of digital transformation that nobody could possibly be happy about. We're trying to do our best. Sorry again about this issue. And what happened after that? A bizarre letter from a department, not a person, but a department. When products are being sent from areas outside the EU into Sweden, oh, I won't read this. It's not interesting enough to read. Here's the interesting part. The person writing this mail offers the opportunity to call 08-592-57999. Uh, that's the number for the import office in Stockholm for FedEx. I tried calling that number. I tried calling that number on my phone as an international call. Didn't work. I tried calling that number on a colleague's phone. That didn't work. I tried with the leading zero and without the leading zero. I asked over time three different people to call this number. The number was out of service in every case. And then completely inexplicably, the day before I'm supposed to leave Sweden, my glasses arrive. I found out about this while I was on the phone to, I think at this point, the seventh person that I had contacted trying to get this problem addressed. Now you might want to say, this is a fairly trivial problem and it got solved. So is there any real business risk to FedEx? Yes, there is, because it's unlikely that I'm ever going to trust FedEx to deliver something to me again. It's not just the software, it's a whole system. And what I worry about is that software encourages the belief that human adaptability and human problem solving aren't important anymore. And that's a disease that I worry is spilling over into testing as well. So what is digital transformation anyway? I mean, when we look at the words, the words seem to be fairly straightforward, digital, it refers to software, electronic systems. Transformation refers to development in some sense, some kind of change. Digital transformation, maybe it's just software development. But I wanted to go a little bit deeper on that. So I looked around and I asked a few people. One of those people was Keith Klein. I'm Keith Klein. I've been working in software testing and quality for a little over 25 years, uh, primarily in investment banking uh, with Barclays, UBS Investment Bank, uh, Citigroup. And most currently, I am the head of quality engineering and the financial services sector for the software testing services and quality engineering practice at KPMG UK. So tell me, Keith, what is digital transformation? I see it most frequently used as taking a part of the business that potentially wasn't digitized, right? Wasn't heavily use of, of technology or is transitioning to a different type of technology, or I think more fundamentally changing the way that operation works within the business through use of technology or changes to technology um, and, and, and transforming the way that business service or business line or operation is conducted. Maybe digital transformation is just a buzzword, a, a fad. When my colleague James Bach and I poked into it, we noticed using a Google Ngram viewer, a, a, the software tool, that the term digital transformation seems first to have been uttered in this context in 1958 or so. For some reason in 2014, we saw a big increase in mentions of the term digital transformation, while a kind of equivalent business process re-engineering plummeted. Why are we hearing so much about it lately? I think part of it is marketing. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think there's 
my my realm in banking, right? The rise of kind of money moving from investment banks to hedge funds to private equity, the investment in fintechs, right, is enormous. So you've seen those from small startups. You've got, you know, Barclays has one, uh, JP Morgan has one, their own investment funds primarily focused on fintechs, right? And that's a very disruptive segment of the financial services uh, 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 business. And so some of that gets packaged under digital transformation where we're trying to disrupt the payments industry, right? Where, you know, there's smaller companies that get bought up or the technology is bought up and deployed and large companies like, you know, First Data and Fiserv, their merger, it was a lot of that was kind of combining some of that FinTech technology in there, uh, the payments business. You know, that's a huge area where there's lots of disruption going on, which you could package as either change or you could call it disruption or you could call it transformation, whichever lens you're looking at it. So I think from from, from my, uh, my perspective, a lot of it has to do with, you know, some marketing, but also what segments you're in and, and what change is happening there at the time. Would you say there's a digital transformation going on in testing? I think there's people trying to make it look like there's a digital transformation happening in testing. But what I tend to experience with a lot of stuff is it's just kind of more of the same. <laughs> okay, as in? The testing industry, you know, it, it, it moves like this really, really, really fast, but doesn't go this way very <laughs> much in my experience over the last 25 years. So there's lots of movement being mistaken for action around this kind of testing transformation piece. Here's the sort of thing that seems to happen to me all the time. I was doing some research for this talk and I wanted to see if digital transformation meant something different in China than it did in the West. So a quick search found me this article on Xinhua. So I decided that I might look for more. When I did, this is the result that came back. So I stopped looking at the web and I decided to ask some person who could help me understand whether digital transformation meant something different in China. That person was my friend and colleague, Tai Xiaomei. Tai Xiaomei is one of the brightest testing minds in the world right now. Uh, in fact, I, um, uh, my organization, this product line is just called the uh, digital transformation product line because our product line, uh, uh, they develop softwares uh, for, for our internal customers for this whole company. So all different businesses areas. Uh, traditionally, the businesses will uh, happen offline, but now they uh, develop softwares uh, to uh, record uh, the everything online, so you can choose. Uh, you have traceability. Uh, you you can uh, you can. Uh, you have some records, data record, the business record, procedural record. Uh, so everything happened in the actual world. Now you can see that in uh, the digital world. So <laughs> they just move everything happening in the physical world. And now you can see that in digital world. <laughs> so I told you the story about all the problems that I had getting my glasses uh, through FedEx, which seemed to be related in some way to big problems doing a digital transformation where they're trying to integrate these uh, systems. Are you seeing the same kinds of problems in China with big projects like that? I think uh, in traditional industries, many of the traditional industries, they are struggling in the first step from offline to offline and uh, there are a lot of issues the segregation between systems, the data, uh, uh, broken data, data, data broken, are incomplete and uh, uh, separate like that. Uh, so people are struggling in, in that situation and uh, uh, for testers, uh, also a nightmare. <laughs> uh, the testers, they, 
they have low efficient test environment, the testers do not understand the systems very well, uh, and the testers can uh, uh, don't know how to test um, from the perspective of uses scenarios. They uh, they don't consider the social issues like that. They only test from the very single personality functionality perspective. So all of these things happen in digital transformation in China now. <laughs> Many years ago, I met a fellow named Mark Fetterman. Unfortunately, Mark's audio is a little bit hard to hear. I'm sorry about that. It was a hardware problem. I'm Mark Fetterman. I'm a coach, helping people and organizations transform at critical times in their respective lives. I do that as a uh, adjunct professor at several universities. I teach in a business school and team dynamics. I teach a psychology program, the psychology of persuasion. I teach qualitative research at both undergrad and graduate levels. Here's what Mark had to say about digital transformation and how long it's been around. I think the world has been digitally transformed. Uh, and it happened arguably 30 years ago um, when as a society we hit the break boundary as Marshall McLuhan would call it of instantaneous multi-way electric communication uh, becoming noticed by everybody so it was no longer this thing that was hidden away in research labs it came onto the scene and at least everybody you know would know that oh email is something and there's this thing called the uh, interweb, the worldwide net, there's something um, that uh, allows people to go to these page things, but nobody knew where the first page was. It, it was all very new, and it was all something that the general public were talking about and became aware of. And at this point, which was arguably 151 years after the telegraph introduced the age of electric communication, we began to notice the effects of it in how it's beginning to change society. So that digital transformation has been going on, arguably for 150 years, but most noticeably for 30 odd years. And here we are in 2022, where nobody thinks twice about how the digital world has transformed everything we do until, like electricity when the power goes out, Rogers goes down, right? Canada's one of Canada's major telecoms goes off the air for a day and all hell breaks loose. What's Mark talking about when he mentions Rogers? Rogers is one of Canada's largest telecom companies. On July 8th, 2022, the company suffered a total collapse of its network because of a coding error in a maintenance update. It's pretty easy to believe that the code wasn't properly tested. The Rogers outage affected people's mobile phone services, their landline services, and their internet services. Well, that might sound like an inconvenience, but it was much more than that. Over 12 hours that lasted through the business day, emergency phone services were disabled. People couldn't call police, fire, or ambulances. Some people weren't able to get into their buildings because the security systems depend on the phone system. The Interact Network, which handles email money transfers and payment processing for large and small businesses all across the country, was down for the day. Merchants couldn't charge people for goods and services, and people couldn't pay for them. Many businesses didn't open at all. The ArriveCan app, which must be used to re-enter the country when traveling from abroad, depends on the Rogers Network and the outage caused even more than the usual chaos for the airlines. Transit systems across the country, including Toronto's, that's the largest one, couldn't handle payments. The most ironic part was that Roger's employees themselves couldn't communicate with each other to fix the problem unless they were able to get handsets or SIM cards from other Canadian telecom providers. So hang on a second. Why are we here? Uh, as testers. What is it the testers do? Well, let's have a look. Let's consider the product as a medium, a medium that is intended to help us or other people provide services. So when I say we here, there's P 
people who have services to provide and the people who want services provided. As testers, one might say that it's our job to identify the differences between the product we want and the product we think we have and the product we've got. Uh, that's all true, but I think that might be an oversimplification. We're not just testing the product. We're not just testing the functions in the product. As testers, what we're testing, among other things, is the set of relationships between the product and the experiences that our customers have with the product. That is, testing isn't just about functions. It's about relationships. And who better to talk about the relationships between people and software than somebody who has studied both of those things deeply? So I'm Harry Collins. I'm a, a professor here at Cardiff University. Uh, and I've been writing for a long time about uh, the nature of knowledge. I'm a sociologist. I suppose I'm a sociologist of knowledge. And I've written three or four books, three books now actually about artificial intelligence. Um, and various papers about computers and knowledge. And uh, pleased to see that you guys like quite like what I, you know, my work, because it fits with the sorts of things that you're trying to say as well. Um, well, the first bit's easy anyway. The fact is that uh, computers are mechanical objects. They're like cars or sets of cogs or something like that. In fact, the first one is uh, literally a set of cogs, wasn't it? Uh, the, um, the Babbage machine with all brass wheels and cogs and so on and so forth. It's probably quite useful to continue to think of, of computers these days as essentially Babbage machines. They're just uh, instantiated in silicon chips and that sort of stuff. But that's one of the things they are. They're, they're those things that where all the cogs have to work together. And if you start missing teeth from the cogs or something like that, they'll go wrong. So one uh, way of thinking about testing computers is to find out whether all the teeth are there and whether the cogs are whirring what right and so on and so forth. But that's the easy bit. The second job of computer testers is decide to decide whether a machine is close enough in what it's doing to allow the humans who are using it to make up for its mistakes and errors that they see going on. And that's the second part of testing. It's not just seeing whether there are teeth missing from the cogs, but whether the machine is actually doing something near enough to what we want, whether the machine is a sufficiently close social prosthesis for us to be able to use it. Now, you asked me, what's a social prosthesis? Well, a prosthesis is something, you know, I lose my leg, I replace it with an artificial leg. That artificial leg does not do exactly the same as the original leg does. But if it's close enough, I'll still be able to make up its deficiencies to, to walk on it. Same goes for an artificial heart. It doesn't exact, uh, act exactly as a, a normal heart. It, it does things a bit different, but my body can make up for the differences. And so the part of the second part of testing is to decide is this thing near enough for the humans to make up for the deficiencies of the prosthesis the differences in the way the prosthesis acts to the way a human act would act in those circumstances in rapid software testing we say that testing is evaluating a product by learning about it through experiencing exploring and experimenting with a special focus on discovering problems that matter to our clients and to their clients. Checking, by contrast, is the process of operating and observing a product using explicit procedures and then applying decision rules to the observations that we're making as the product is running and relaying the outcome of those decision rules to a human who can interpret and evaluate what has happened. Checking is a way of checking the output of a product, checking the functions in a product, checking the behavior of a product. But notice that checking 
is only part of testing. A check is the part of a test that can be automated. We can do this algorithmically, mechanistically. Now, of course, it's possible for a human to make exactly the same kind of evaluations. And it's true that humans make those evaluations much more slowly and uh, uh, sometimes less reliably. On the other hand, a check only checks what humans have instructed it to check. A check can at least in principle be programmed to be performed by a machine. A check is a form of instrumented testing. Testing is instrumented to the degree that some intervening medium alters the tester's encounter with the product compared to that of some contemplated user. For the last 25 years, people have been touting digital transformations in testing. Digital transformation for testing always seems to involve putting media in between our experience of the product we've got and the product that we think we have, and other media in between the product we think we have and the experiences that our customers have. I see that as something worth worrying about. We don't want our testing to be over-instrumented. Building and checking the product is profoundly different from experiencing it. In the rush to continuous integration and continuous deployment, one of the things that we're doing is we are paying more attention to the building and checking of the product and less attention to the actual experiencing of it. And those things are profoundly different. Checks do not automatically let us know about confusion that a user might experience, impatience that a user might experience, frustration that people might experience. And that's why it's important for us to think not in terms of manual testing, but experiential testing. Testing from the perspective of somebody who's going to be interacting with the software and presumably trying to solve problems with it. So what's experiential testing? Testing is experiential to the degree that the tester's encounter with the product is practically indistinguishable from that of the contemplated user. Testing is interactive to the degree that the tester is present and engaged to attend and observe and operate the product directly. That sounds kind of close to experiential testing, but some operations of a product are done in an instrumented way all the time, like when a developer is interacting with an API. The level to which testing is experiential is one thing, the level to which testing is interactive is another. We can also think in terms of transformational testing. Testing is transformational to the degree that the tester is changed by the encounter with the product. Learning through discovery is one kind of transformation. Contrast that with transactional testing, in which the tester is basically unaffected by the encounter with the product, as the tester might be unaffected by the encounter with automated checks. All of these are different ways of thinking about the concept of manual testing. Testing is neither manual nor automated. We don't talk about automated researchers. We don't talk about automated journalists. We don't talk about automated programmers or automated managers. Testing is not manual. Testing is cognitive. Testing is psychological. Testing is emotional. Testing is investigative. Testing is all about discovery. And it seems to me that a big part of what we have to do as testers is not just to analyze the product, but to experience it. In other words, consider using the damned thing. It's easy enough for the builders of a product to try it and test it in a fairly shallow way and say, it works. It's our job as testers to recognize that we've got to look for deep, intermittent, rare, subtle, hidden problems that are emergent. Problems that aren't immediately obvious from the putting together of presumably reliable components, because sometimes those components interact in ways that are surprising or erroneous. As testers, we've got to be on the lookout for that because 
these problems really do affect people. Your role as a tester, right, is to provide some critical distance between what the project's producing and what you're observing through how it's being de deployed or released, right, or how it's functioning. And that critical distance, if you're working on a project team that wants you to confirm that things are okay to go out, you're in a very dangerous place as a project. And a big chunk of the value we provide is that critical distance, right? Somebody's got to do it. And that can't be provided through automation because that's just only going to tell us things we already know. The, the, the primary question I try and get out of them is, what do you want to learn about your system so that you can make a safe and informed decision about whether to unleash it on your business and your customers? What do you need to know to manage your business? That to me is why we test something, to learn something. You, you need to think uh, beyond software. You need to think beyond software, uh, such as the social concerns, uh, interaction with some other systems like that. Uh, if you if you only test from the software functionality perspective, um, you can never think of, uh, you can never imagine how uh, serious effect that the this functionality of software can cause. The next frontier, I think, for systems testers, not software testers per se, but you've got to think of them in terms of system testers, because with the digital transformation thing, we as people are now part of that system. We legitimately are part of that system. It's no longer just the digital, it is the transformation is that people are now part of a system. So to sum up, there are a bunch of things that we don't want to get lost as we go through digital transformations, especially as testers. We don't want to lose our capacity to think in terms of systems. We've got to think in terms of business risk. We've got to think in terms of problems. That's the thing that makes testers different from everybody else. It's our job to focus on problems while everybody else is focusing on success. Well, we've talked about a lot of things. At this point, I'd like to offer you something that could help you right away in terms of organizing and strategizing your testing. It starts with four questions. And these questions can be asked whether you're interacting with a product directly, testing it experientially, or designing tests, or whether you're in a planning meeting. Question one, what are we building? Question two, who are we building it for? Question three, what could go wrong? That's the tester question. Question four, how would we know? That's the testability question. You can add some modifiers to those things too. You can say, what else are we building? Who else are we building it for? What else could go wrong? And how else would we know? Or you could also ask, what are we not building? What are we forgetting to build? Or what do we want to avoid building? Who are we not building it for? Who are we forgetting? Or who are we trying to avoid giving access to the system, like hackers, such that we don't want them to use the system? What could not go wrong? Well, that's a funny sounding question, but if we raise it, maybe we'll consider the possibility of things that would surprise us by going wrong, that we didn't think could go wrong. And of course, how would we not know? That prompts us to consider things that we could build into the product that would help us to detect problems. Those four questions, I think, can be really helpful to you. So, happy testing.